<clears throat> Father, we just thank you again, Lord, for this morning, for this day, Lord, for the privilege of coming together in your name, for being able to worship you, Lord, with the freedom that we still do have remaining. And Lord, it is a dark day in our country, Lord, but in the midst of it, you shine bright. And so, Lord, I, I pray that uh, we would reflect that light because we know, Lord, that it doesn't come from anything else but by, from your people. So help us to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. Help us not to hide it under a basket as your word would tell us. But Lord, let us reflect where truth comes from and let us reflect where the only real love comes from. And help us to walk in that, Lord, and not hide from the world. But Lord, I do ask that you would protect us from the world as we wait for your return, as we wait for that day that you take us into your presence. And Lord, we wish for that day to come soon. But we have things to do, Lord. We have things to do, and I pray that you would keep us to those tasks that you've assigned us. And that you'd help us to do it with peace in our hearts. And help us to walk in the power that you give us by the presence of your spirit within us. And so, Lord, we just turn this portion of our service now over to you as you share your word with us. Lord, let it be a reminder of the price that you paid that we might call ourselves children of God. What a mighty thing you did, Lord. Help us to celebrate that this morning as we look into that part of your story now. So we yield to your spirit. We give you this time. And we just welcome you here in our midst, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can open with me to Mark chapter 15. Kind of thought we'd be finishing the book this week, but not going to happen. And you brought me up here earlier than usual, so look out. Yep. You know, last week we moved through that final night of Jesus' life on earth. And we saw a series of trials take place. And every one of those trials was illegal for different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is it was done at night. And it's interesting how things are done in the darkness that are evil. You know, we even see that in the events that are unfolding in our country. Protests peaceful by day and evil by night. And the Bible speaks of that habit in people. But one of the interesting things that ran as a thread through all of those trials was the fact that nobody, even the accusers that brought Jesus there, could find anything wrong. The accusers couldn't keep their story straight. Those that were in authority over those trials even asked the questions, what is it that this man has done? Pilate even spoke to Jesus. And they were all marveling at the fact that he didn't even seek to defend himself, but he did agree with their identification of him. But you know, it's interesting, and we may not know it, but we don't want to miss it, is that Jesus was going to the cross as the Lamb of God, a Lamb without spot, without blemish. And he was doing that within the Passover week. And during the Passover week, the lambs were brought into the homes of the people that would slay them on, on that day of the Passover, um, remembering what had happened in Egypt all those years before as, they were, as the Israel was brought out of slavery. And the thing about that lamb, it had to be without spot and without blemish. Nothing could be broke, there could be no mar upon its body, no mutation. And interestingly here, the Lamb of God is brought through these trials, proving himself to be without spot and without blemish. And so that lamb was only a representation of the lamb that would go to the cross for us. You know, they did the inspection of that lamb four days before the actual Passover. And they would bring that lamb into the house, as I said, and keep it for four days. And what's interesting is that's what was instructed to the Hebrews when they were in Egypt. And one of the things we don't think about, and it's really not taught or mentioned very often, and it's not in the biblical story, but the lamb was worshipped in Egypt. 
It was one of their gods. And so can you understand the impact, the symbology of that in Egypt when they took that god of theirs, small g, into their homes and they cared for it and then they slew it. And they would take the blood and put it on the lintel of the door so that the angel of death would pass over. But it had much more going on there. Just like when we look at the cross, there's much more going on. We know the story. We're going to see it this morning. And yet, I think there's so much that was beyond the veil that we could even see that was going on. Things that he championed for us, things that he fought against, he being Jesus for us, that we don't get to see. But I believe, and I'll share that with you in a moment, that he perceived in those moments at the cross what was beyond the veil, what he was battling for us. You know, sometimes when they go, we go through these stories, people go a great length to make sure that you feel everything that Jesus felt. They get the, the full scientific description of the, of the crucifixion and all, everything that was done to Jesus' body. I've done that myself. We're not going to do that this morning. But we need to let the weight of Jesus' sacrifice for us sit upon us this morning as we remember it. You know, the world's a mess. And it's a mess because they don't have Jesus. But we do. I hope every one of you does. And because of that, we should not be a mess. And I know right now the world wants to mess us up. It wants to mess with our thinking. It wants to mess with our hearts. It wants to take away our hope. It wants us to fear. We need to turn away from that. But what we need to turn towards is the cross. Because that's where we were rescued from those things. And so let these words, as dark as they are this morning, as, as horrible as this story really can be seen, let it be something to cast hope into your life. Let's pick up in verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and he was, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Now in those days, a king often wore purple, a purple robe, and they often wore a gilded wreath of leaves on their head as a crown. And when we see this crude banter of these soldiers come to an end, they put his own clothes back on him after they had mocked him as a king. And they lead him out to crucify him. And like everyone who faced that crucifixion, Jesus was led away and forced to carry the beam of wood that he would hang upon. Now, the entirety of the cross the post that was in the ground, the beam that would have been across the shoulders of the individual being crucified, in total weighed something around 300 pounds. Now the victim carried that crossbar themselves, and that weighed anywhere from about 75 to 125 pounds. And they would have stripped that individual down so that rough hewn wood would have been laying across the bare skin that was laid open by the beating that Jesus had taken and his probably being worse than any other. Matter of fact, the Bible makes that clear that he wasn't even recognizable as a man at that point. So when that victim carried the crossbar, usually they were stripped naked and their hands were often tied to the wood. You see the images of someone on a cross, Jesus in particular, and you see the ropes and you think, well, if they nailed him, why'd they tie him? But the fact is the ropes were there because that's what was tied, as that beam was tied to him to carry through the streets and up onto that hill. The upright beams were permanently fixed in the ground. So they would just take the person and they would attach them to that. And we always see them lay the board down and I don't know how all that worked. We only have pictures in movies. But it was from historical accounts, they say the beams were always in the ground. So if they lifted them up, laid them down, attached the person and brought it back up, and we can let our imaginations run with that. But as we witness this account, and we see that Jesus was simply too weak 
to carry his crossbar because of all the beating that he took. So he falls under the weight of the beam that he's carrying. And the fact is, no Roman that was there, and there was all the soldiers and who knows who else, they wouldn't help him carry it. And the fact is that public crucifixions were a great advertisement for the power of Rome. So they preferred to keep the victim alive until they were crucified, so they didn't want this individual dying in the street. And the centurion could have compelled a Jewish person, which I'm sure there was many around, to carry that cross, but that decision probably would have led to an upheaval or even a riot. So the best solution was to take a stranger. And it says this person was coming in from the country. Remember, this was the time of the pilgrimage. We talked about that last week. The city was filled with pilgrims coming in to one of the three feast days that were mandatory for Jewish men within a certain distance to attend in the city. So they grabbed this man, Simon from Cyrene, which was a place in Syria, in North Africa. Um, and they compelled him, it tells us, which means they placed him into service. He didn't really have the authority to say no. He didn't have that freedom at all. And it says that this man was the father of Rufus. Now, and in another, in another name there as well. We don't know much about the other name. And Rufus, we, want, we can just wonder. Maybe this Rufus was the same one that was mentioned in Romans. Chapter 16, verse 13. There it says... Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. It may have been the same Rufus. And if it was the same Rufus, and he was being mentioned in Scripture, he was probably a strong believer, and his father, this man, may have learned lessons in his own life about what it meant to pick up a cross and carry it. Because Christians at that time would have been under persecution. And so maybe there was some huge thing going on in this man's heart in his life when this God chose him for this purpose. We'll never know. Maybe we'll meet him in heaven and we'll have that conversation. Look at verse 22. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. So there it says they brought him. In Mark 15, 20, it says they led him out to be crucified. But by... Two verses later, the situa situation changed, and it says they brought him to the place of Golgotha. So Jesus could walk when he left his beating, but by this point, he's already at a place where he could hardly walk, which is why the beam that he carried had to be shared with another. They had to bring him. Now, Golgotha, it's the Aramaic word meaning skull. And Calvary, that we hear very often, is the Latin name for the same thing. That's why it's sometimes called the Hill of Calvary um, and not so often talked about as Golgotha. Now, there's a controversy about the exact historical location of where that hill is at. If you visit Israel, they're going to tell you two different things. They're going to point to the Holy Sepulchre and they're going to say that's where it happened. And um, I don't know if that's true or not. It's been so commercialized and built up that a lot of people s tend to stay away from that. Um, it attracts a lot of, of pilgrims, a lot of tourists even to this day. But then there's a place called Gordon's Calvary. And Gordon's Calvary, I mean, I'm sure at one time it was kind of out in the wild. Now you're kind of in the midst of things when you're at that location. There's a bus station very close. Um, but I'll tell you, when I visited there, it was the one place of all the places that I visited where they said, this is where this happened and this is where that happened. But there was something about that place that made me think, this is, this is where this happened. And, and I could be wrong, and who knows? And, and does it matter? But I don't know. There was just something about that place. The way the garden, because it tells us it would be a garden tomb. And it, just the way the garden is there, and of course it's maintained to look like it does, but it was always there. And just the way that it's hewn out of that rock, that tomb, just seems, I don't know, when I stepped inside of it, it just seemed. I don't know. They're way smaller than you would believe. And then there's the, the actual hillside. And at that time, fortunately, before it, something changed, and I'll tell you what that was in a moment, the hillside looks like a skull. You've got to use a little bit of imagination because over time it's been eroded, and now it doesn't look like it at all because a huge piece of it fell off. 
That's kind of sad. But it did. It looked just like the face of a skull. And so all of that, I mean, it definitely felt like that was the place that this took place. It says there, they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Now, if you understand what this drink was, you'll understand how um, significant it was that he didn't take it. Because if anybody needed it physically, it would be him at that moment. Now, tradition says that respected women of Jerusalem provided a narcotic drink to those condemned to death in order to degree, um, decrease the sensitivity to all the excruciating pain that they were going to have on the cross, and in Jesus' case, even before the cross. And it was a humane practice, and it began in response to a particular verse, set of verses. And those verses are Proverbs 31, verse 6 and 7. And there it says, Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So it was given in a medicinal sense, but he refused it. Look at verse 24. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him, and the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. Now as we go through this, you may be thinking of other things that happened, because the other gospels are much richer about this event and really compared to Mark, most events are much richer because Mark was just to the point. Now I could take us and give us a parallel study of all the different things that happened in all the different uh, Gospels, the different perspectives of this event. I mentioned some of them, but not all. So don't feel like I'm leaving them out. You know most of them. You've heard the stories. But it says there, and they crucified him. And that's it. Now in those days, that would have been enough said. Because this thing we call crucifixion that we look on with horror, they looked on with horror in those days every day. They would have passed by this all the time. It was set up along a public pathway. And there would have been bodies there on what we call the cross, some call a tree, um, most of the time. And so there wasn't much for Mark to say. It was just understood that this is something the Romans did. Now, it's interesting that they played this game, and I'm sure it wasn't unique to Jesus' case, that they would throw, they would cast lots for their possessions. They probably did that with everybody that was crucified, taking from the victim things that they possessed. But what's interesting about that is we read about this very thing prophesied in Psalm 22, verse 18. And it says there, they divide my garments among them, for my clothing they cast lots. And what's very interesting about that is that was written 1,000 years before this moment that we're studying here that happened 2,000 years ago. So those words I just read you from Psalm 22, and we're going to share more from Psalm 22 here in a moment, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years before the very event that Jesus, in his words, speaking about himself as he describes that very day. So it was about 9 a.m. when they crucified him. And over his head, they had put the title, the King of the Jews, according to Mark. Now, this inscription does differ in the different Gospels. And I want to just tell you what each one of them said. In Matthew, it said that the sign said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In John, it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And in Luke, it said, this is the King of the Jews. So I'm certain that you take all four of those and rewrite it, which we can't because we'd have to guess the inscription would have been thus, that this is the king of the Jews. And the irony is that he was, and he is. And so they thought they were mocking him, but they were stating a truth, and they posted it above his head. Pick up with me in verse 27. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left, so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So two robbers crucified with him, one on each side. We know from other gospels there was a conversation that happened between the two robbers, one speaking to Jesus, Jesus making him a promise of his future salvation because he showed faith even there. 
And so for anybody, you or someone you meet someday in the future, or maybe you know somebody already that has the opinion that something's wrong with the deathbed confession, you can take him to this. Because that man was saved. In his last final moment, as dark as that guy's life probably was, and as late as it was in his life, he said, I believe. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so people, I've heard people with weird opinions about deathbed confessions. Well, it's scriptural. Now, Isaiah foretold that he would be associated with these criminals at his death. I'm going to read you that verse from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. It says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now that verse, that foretelling, that prophecy of Jesus' last moments, well, it wasn't a thousand years old. It was only 700 years before the very event. And I emphasize those things because what it should do, what it always must do, is give us confidence in what God has laid out for our future. Just because the word is old doesn't mean the word isn't current and true and will be fulfilled exactly as it's been written. And so we need to have confidence in that. Now, I've mentioned Psalm 22. And I've mentioned now Isaiah 53. And I want you to know that if you ever have the privilege of witnessing to a Jewish person and you want to tell them about the Lord, I'm going to tell you which end of the story you don't want to start with. You don't want to start with, and this is my personal experience, and if you've had a different experience, that's fine, I'm giving you my own. Don't start with Jesus being Lord and Savior and they need to believe that, and confess it, and be saved. You need to know where they come from. And if you can speak to them from the Old Testament, and by the way, I can make a case for Christ out of the first five books of the Bible. I don't need the New Testament, although you have it, and you should know it, and you should use it. But I'm telling you, if you ever get to witness to a Jewish person, you need to start with their Jewishness. After years and years and years of people trying to bring me the Lord, the only person that ever got through to me was somebody that started with my Jewishness. And I just told you the story last week about my mom, who will be 80 in a couple months, being saved at this late part of her life. All the things I gave her to read over the years, all the things I spoke to her, she listened. But it was finally a book on Isaiah 53 that did the job. Isaiah 53 was what brought me. Psalm 22 was part of that story. And a little booklet that explained the messianic perspective of the Passover meal. So let, just let that be something you put in your arsenal when you get to witness to a Jewish person. Start with their side of it. It'll make all the difference in the world, I promise you. Pick up with me in verse 29. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross, Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him until the point where one confessed. And we always hear about the two thieves. When I read that final part there, and even those who were crucified with him reviled him, I wonder if there weren't more. I wonder if there weren't more. Because if they could put 10 up instead of three, they probably would have just got it done. But notice one of the things that's said there. Descend from the cross that we may see and believe. That's another argument. That's another pushback that you'll get from people you witness to. I don't know if you have. I have. You know, Let, let him come and then I'll believe. Let him show himself and then I'll believe. And we always got to kindly and with love turn that argument around. No, you believe, and then he'll come. And a matter of fact, he's here already. You just need to have spiritual eyes to see. And so we've spoke about Psalm 22, and I want to read to you most of it this morning. If you want to hold a finger where you're at and jump over to Psalm 22 with me, you can do that. It's in the book of Psalms. 
It's a very special psalm to me. It should be special to all of us, but it's not one of those psalms, although it ends brightly like a lot of psalms do. It is a dark, dark psalm. Because this is a first person perspective that Jesus had of his time on the cross and what he was seeing. It's one of the messianic psalms. Let's begin in verse 1. And immediately you'll hear the fulfillment of this in the New Testament at the very event that we're covering this morning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? From the first verse, I want you to feel along with Jesus as much as we can what he was feeling on the cross. That he felt abandoned at that point. Knew what he was doing. And yet because of a momentary separation from his father so that sin, your sin, my sin, could be placed upon him. He had that feeling of abandonment. Verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I, I am a worm and no man a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God be not far from me for trouble is near for there is none to help many bulls have surrounded me strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint my heart is like wax it has melted within me my strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You've brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They took, they, they look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. I believe when we read Things like verse 12, they have surrounded me, the bulls, the strong bulls of Bashan. And then he talks about them gaping with their mouths, the raging and roaring lion, like dogs, he says, all around. I believe that he was seeing beyond the veil. I believe, mainly because he's Jesus, he was able to see spiritually all that was happening around him. And I believe that hell and hell's fury was surrounding him in a gleeful dance because they thought they won. They thought their time had come. They had finally, after eons, got to the point where they had destroyed God's plan to save man. And I believe Jesus was looking at that spiritual realm and seeing demons and devils dancing around that cross that day. And so on top of the physical pain that he had, on top of that abandonment that he felt in that moment of separation from God the Father, I believe he also had to endure seeing hell's fury right there in his face. And I believe that that then you also see what was influencing the people around the cross that were bringing him that, those words that hurt so greatly. Again, 700 years before, we hear Jesus' words speak of what he would endure on the cross someday. Pick up with verse 33 now again with me. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So if the th third hour was nine, you can imagine what time it is for the sixth hour and the ninth hour. I'll let you do the math. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, 
Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Exactly as we just read in the psalm. Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. So between noon and three o'clock, for those three hours, the whole land was shrouded in darkness. Luke tells us that the sun was darkened, but Mark makes it clear it stayed dark for three solid hours. There was a Roman historian, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, I'm going to try, I think it's Phlegon or Phlegon, but this Roman historian recorded these words. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun. At the sixth hour, the day turned into dark night so that the stars in heaven were seen and there was an earthquake. Now, what's especially remarkable about this, in light of what that non-believer would have just, what he recorded, what the remarkable thing is, is this happened at the Passover. And the Passover always and only happens during a full moon. It can't be done any other time. And a natural eclipse of the sun cannot happen during a full moon. And so... Whether it's by science or by the witness of a non-believer, we can take comfort in the fact that this absolutely happened. And it could have only happened by the hand of God. And it wasn't an eclipse. So Jesus cries out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22, as you've just seen. Now, Jesus knew pain and suffering in his life. But he never knew the separation from his father. Never. Jesus was always. He always existed. From whatever it is when we look back in time to whatever it is when we look in future, Jesus has always been. And in all that time, until the time of the cross, he had never felt what he felt that day. Never felt that separation. Now he knew what that felt like. Now, Jesus rightly felt forsaken at that moment. At that moment, Jesus bore the full judgment of God. The full judgment, not against him. The full judgment against us. You and I. The full judgment against our sin was placed upon him. He suffered spiritual desolation. He had a separation from God. Now, I don't believe any mortal mind can understand the agony that he endured at that moment when he had to become the sacrifice for sin when he had none when he was the perfect unblemished unspotted lamb of god in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 paul says for he made him to who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him it was done for us. And as terrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. Therefore, Isaiah accurately says this, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself at the cross. Now, the voices that the mob or the voices of the mob suggested that Jesus and what they heard him say was calling out to Elijah. They believed that Elijah was going to come rescue him. They got that from him saying Eloi or Eloi or Eloi, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And as a final indignity, one of them soaked a sponge in sour wine and offered it to him at the end of a reed. The people continued, even in that moment, as he was on the cross, to misunderstand him. They mocked him until the very end. 
And the thing is, they knew just enough of their Bible to get it really wrong. That's why they had this wild speculation thinking that Elijah would come and rescue him. And you know, that's the tragedy of knowing only a little bit of your Bible. It's because you can get it really wrong. There are those within the body of Christ and those outside the body of Christ especially that will take bits and pieces of what Scripture has to say and use it for whatever purpose fits what they want it to fit. And we need to be able to identify when something's out of context. We need not to use ever a verse of the Bible out of context. That's why when we hear a single verse and you don't know where it's at, go look at where it's at. And as your curiosity should be, and as your habit should be as a student of the word, don't ever just read the verse when you're there. At a minimum, I tell people, go up two verses and down five. Matter of fact, just read the chapter. Why don't you read the book? Find out why it's there. What it means within the context. We all have verses we use out of context. I don't have any examples at the ready. But when they come up, I always point them out. There's things we use, and it doesn't mean it doesn't speak to those other things. But it isn't necessarily the context of what it was used. But here, they didn't know their word well enough. Because what is the truth? The truth is, is they knew their word well enough. They would have known that they were, for the last three plus years looking at the Messiah. They would have known who came. They would have known who was on that cross at that moment. And yet, with the entirety of Scripture available to us today, and even for some that have read it all, there's that misunderstanding. So Jesus' cry was done with strength, and we need to know that that cry came as a sign of triumph as he breathed his last. And his death, listen, that was an act of his will. That wasn't an involuntary collapse on the cross. He gave his life. And we need to always know that and see it that way. In John chapter 19 verse 30 it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now that phrase there in John, it is finished. It's only one word in the ancient Greek. And that word in the ancient Greek means paid in full. It was what was used when you paid off a debt. It would be stamped, paid in full. So this was a cry of victory. Jesus paid in full the debt of sin that we owed. He fulfilled that eternal purpose on the cross. He paid our bill, if you will. A bill that we couldn't pay. You know, I read that, I, one of my favorite hymns come up, comes up in mind, and I'm not going to sing it to you. But the words, some of the words of that hymn is, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He paid it all. Everything that I owed, everything that you owed was paid that day. Pick up in verse 38. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less and of Joseph, and Salome who also followed him and ministered him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So two amazing events took place at the death of Jesus. Matthew tells us there was an earthquake, and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Now tradition says the way that that was assembled, that curtain, that it would have been inches thick of cloth. I've heard the number four inches used. You can imagine the power it would take to rip four inches of material. And not only that, but from the top to the bottom. Very evident act of God himself. Now the curtain had separated man from God. But now through Jesus' death, he opened the entire world to a new and life-giving way. 
Remember, only the high priest and only once a year could pass beyond that curtain to bring the blood of the sacrifice and put it on the bema seat, the mercy seat that sat upon the ark of the triumph. And he would put that blood there and only he could go there. But it was only temporary. That blood would only secure their atonement for one year. And they would have to do it again. But now the blood of the perfect Lamb of God had been shed. And it was now a done deal for eternity. This process didn't have to take place anymore. So that curtain gets ripped open. And now we have, boldly, Jesus invites us, the access into that throne room ourselves. No longer needing a priest as our advocate. Because not only does Jesus and his spirit live within us as believers, but we are now a holy priesthood. And we can approach that directly. What a gift. The words that the writers, writer of Hebrews shared on this, I think, is worth us hearing. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 12. It said, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies and are made, of, made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, being set apart. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hmm. Now you may recall there was an earthquake at Sinai upon the mountain when the law was given. But now, the law was fulfilled in Jesus and the curse was removed. Romans chapter 10 verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does that tell us? It's not an end to the law in the sense that it no longer guides us. It's not the end of the law in the sense that it's no longer our standard or code of conduct. It's the end of the law being our way to attain righteousness. Because originally the law was giving so that someone who could follow it completely would attain righteousness. The lesson in the law was that one cannot. Which is why endlessly they were to bring sacrifices and let blood be loosed so that they could be forgiven for a moment. But now righteousness would be attained by faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Every time this comes up, I speak of it, and I must speak of it again. Not, it's always been, but it's so strong right now. And it's called by many things. One of the things it's called is the Hebrew Roots Movement. But there's a great movement to take people back under the law. Their misunderstanding of what the law was for guides them there. And these aren't simple people. These are some brilliant men that I respect that I hear teach this now. But there's great movement to take people back to it because there's this fear in their misunderstanding that I must do something. I must honor the law by following it. And, and, and I'm guilty of being rather flippant with those individuals because I, 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 I tease in a sense and it's probably not right of me. 
But I say, good luck. And I say, and, and so what if you do? It's a code of conduct. It's rules for living. It is the moral code that we must understand and at least try to obey. But to think that we're somehow bringing more honor to God by following that or putting ourselves back under that, where people are fooling themselves because what they're doing at that moment is they're turning their backs on the very work that we're reading about this morning and they're saying grace isn't enough. I don't judge these people. My heart goes out to them because I'm reading very clearly that the law no longer has that purpose. And so you would have to literally ignore the teachings of Scripture to believe that. Or at least let other scriptures override these and then justify it from here to the end. But notice there what I read out of Galatians chapter 3 verse 14. It said that he hung there, cursed as everyone who hangs in a tree, to take us, to take us out from underneath the curse. And it said that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. What was the blessing of Abraham? The blessing of Abraham is that his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Jesus, Abraham was saved by faith. And see, that's another thing that has to be ignored. Because if you go to the law and you miss what happened to Abraham, then you're going to believe the law is what saves. Paul tells us the law was a tutor. The law was a mirror. You, ha you ha hold it up, you look into it, and you go, wow, I'm not righteous. And then you have to understand to break one is to break all. No one can fulfill it doesn't mean it's not important doesn't mean it's not a guide for life but Abraham's faith was accounted to him as righteousness and by the way the law wasn't given for another 400 years when you think about that you really have to argue with the thought that I must go back under it to be righteous And not only did Jesus take us out from underneath the burden of the law, he also freed us from the sacrifices. Because that was part and parcel with the law. Could you imagine if that's what we had to do? I'm so thankful that's not ours. What a burden. And what an almost ridiculous act. I say ridiculous with respect because God told them they needed to. But there in that also was the lesson. The lesson that it was the blood that saved. But then he also instructs that that's not really what he ever wanted. He just wanted the obedient heart. And that was the main thing that the sacrifices were teaching. Was to be obedient to the ordinances of God. Now this centurion that we wrote, read about a moment ago. A centurion was very important. A very important soldier. Had just his name, Centurion, speaks of a hundred. He was in charge of at least a hundred men. And he was there at the cross. And I like to think he got saved because he confessed Jesus before men. Some like watered down that he didn't really believe. He just know. I mean, what's he say? He said, this man is truly the son of God. And so the salvation that the cross brings began at the cross. What a beautiful thing. And no wonder... I mean, he, he must have been paying attention, and I don't know how the others didn't. Or maybe in their hate-filled hearts, they were just blinded to the things that were going on around them. Let, look at the scene from Matthew's perspective. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Pretty big so far, huh? And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. That's pretty significant. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What a day. What a day. The centurion saw Jesus for who he was. And it's a picture of all those that come to Jesus through the cross. At the cross, people saw that Jesus was the Son of God, and this fulfilled Jesus' own promise. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. 
Now, Mark mentions that certain women remained at the cross. And it deserves mention. The women shine brightly in the gospel narratives. I mean, think about it. Personal safety drew or drove the men into hiding. But the devotion of the women put their love for Jesus above their own welfare. They were at the cross and they were the first at the tomb. And so they get a lot of credit for what the men wouldn't do. Look at verse 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, let me stop there for a moment, preparation day. That would have been the day that they actually slaughtered the Passover lamb. And there was a certain time that that Passover lamb would be slaughtered. It was the rule. Everybody slaughtered the lamb at that particular time. Would you like to guess? Three in the afternoon. The very moment that Jesus gave up his life on the cross. At the very moment those Passover lambs, those earthly lambs, were being sacrificed. The Lamb of God laid his life down in a perfect sacrifice for us. Back to our verse, verse 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Am Am yeah, Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking <clears throat> courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. So Jesus, the Son of Man, he had no place to lay his head while he was alive. But here in death he did. But only temporarily. It was preparation day. That's the day before the Sabbath we just read. Now the Sabbath begins, would have began that day, Friday, at 6 p.m. It had only been three hours since Jesus had laid his life down. And they needed to take prompt action because that at that moment, when the six o'clock time came and the Sabbath began on that Friday evening, they could do nothing. They had to get this done quickly. So Joseph makes this appeal for the body of Jesus. But he didn't really have time to embalm him the way they would have. So he wraps him in fine linen. And so we know that when the women came to the tomb later to find it empty, they were coming with what? Spices. They were coming to do to the body what they would have done prior, but there had been no time. Because that's the way they, they did it in those days. They would have packed them in with the spices, wrapped them in the linen, sort of embalming him. Now this Joseph was a devout Jew. He perhaps, by the way they describe him, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the leading party. And Pilate, we find out here, was challenged by the news that Jesus was dead already. And that was really some of the mercy that God had on that situation, God the Father. But the centurion then confirms the news, and the governor grants the body to Joseph. You know, what's interesting is that in the scripture, in the Greek, two different words are used there for the body of Jesus. Jesus Joseph asks for the body of Jesus. Pilate grants him the corpse. Perspective of the world versus the perspective of a believer. You know, the world has not partaken of the body of Christ. Instead, they see a corpse and they reject him. There is even some religions that have him still hanging on the cross. Mistake. You know, those who do not partake of the body of Christ, those that reject him, will remain in that state. They will be the corpse someday without being raised to new life, given a new body. You know, I can only think of one place in Scripture to, to, to turn to when I consider that. What Jesus spoke about him very, very, himself, about why 
what his purpose was in coming and what it would bring. You know, it's that verse that's written down and held up on a sign in every sports stadium. There's a man who's been gracious to put up signs all over Douglas County that has that verse. But you know what's interesting? I've always thought this. I'm not the type to hold up a sign at a sporting event. But if I was, I would change it up. I wouldn't have 316. I'd have, three, I'd have 317. Let me read you 16 and 17 and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. If you're going to witness to somebody and you're going to use 316, use 317. They need to know that he didn't come to condemn, but to save. Because that's a hang up by so many people. That he's just, it's a condemning thing. They look at our faith and they think it's condemning. In verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, that's what I was talking about a moment ago. When those that don't believe, they're going to remain in that state. And then they have the classification of corpse. We who believe will be led into eternity with God, given a new body. And so you can share that with someone either. Give them a choice. It's kind of graphic. Do you want to be a body in death or do you want to be a corpse? It was important enough for the Holy Spirit to use those two terms to recognize the difference in that conversation between those two men. So with care, Joseph and Nicodemus, we read about that in John. These are two men that were in leadership that came to believe in Jesus. So it was not just Joseph on his own. It was also Nicodemus. You can read about that in John 19. Wrapped him in linen. They put him in a new tomb belonging to Joseph. And as I said, they were only wrapped them in linen because they didn't have the time to do the proper things they would have done to the body before his burial. And those tombs were very expensive. So it was quite a sacrifice for Joseph of Arimathea to even offer his tomb. Ha! But Jesus only needed it for a few days. And next week we're going to talk about what was going on while he was in that tomb. And see the conclusion. And now you know the story. But we'll get to celebrate that next week. What happens. What I want to do though is I was reading around. And I found this poem. And I just want to share this poem to close us this morning. <coughs> it was written in 2004. It was written by a man whose name I can't pronounce. His initials are VB. And his he's definitely maybe European or actually let's I'm not going to guess it's uh Gidgesberth Gidgebert <clears throat> Behold the bleeding lamb of God uplifted on the tree his blood streams forth a crimson tide to set the sinner free with crushing blows the mallet strikes and nails his hands and feet there on the cursed tree he hangs that law and peace might meet. No sorrows like to his are known, such pain was never felt. The wrath for us on him is poured, a sight our hearts to melt. Low piercing thorns are made a wreath to crown the king of kings. His blood drips down his anguished face as he salvation brings. Hark to the cries, his heart gives voice of love untold before. The sinner's friend, <coughs> through his own pain, forgiveness does implore. Upon himself he bears our sin, was made a curse for them, that God might view us in his Christ and never our souls condemn. What torment on his soul is poured, he trembles from the pain, the anguish of the dying hour was for our life to gain. Oh, who can estimate the love that fills him to the end? His father's glory in his own to save his bride that sinned. 
Behold the dying Lamb of God who suffers in your stead. Tis finished, sounds his victory cry, then bows his sacred head. A spear releases all his love by giving one last blow, the fount to open in his side where blood and water flow. There hangs the sinless, spotless lamb, our debt and death to pay, makes perfect sacrifice to God and takes our sin away. Then soon to glory he does rise, the all-victorious king, now pleads his blood and soon will come us to himself to bring. What glory then shall we behold? The thought should us amaze. Yet now we behold the Lamb, the crown him with our praise. Worship and come up, ushers. Let's go into the communion time this morning with this all on our hearts recognizing what he laid down for us the price that he paid and you know I would add to that and probably highlight his willingness to do it all by choice all the way through and so father we thank you this morning for your word Lord I thank you for the way that it convicts I thank you for the way that it reminds us Lord, I thank you for the things that it teaches us. Lord, I pray that if anyone here this morning or hears my voice later as recorded, that this now has convicted of their walk apart from Jesus, that they would see this as their opportunity to claim that work that he did on the cross as theirs, to find that gift of salvation and ask for it to come into their heart and life so that they would become your child as well. And so I pray for that one, Lord, for those maybe more than one that don't know you yet. And Lord, I pray that today they would lift up their eyes and they would bow their heart and they would say, I do to you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, for those of us that know you, Lord, I pray that this morning we would know you better and we would be reminded of your sacrifice how important the cross is to us. Lord, convict us where we need conviction. Bless us where you will. Cover us in your grace. Grant us your mercies. And Lord, just continue to love us until we're standing in your presence and then, Lord, love us forever. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.